Hello and welcome to Indus Special. I'm Michelle Malik. On the 10th of March, the Association of Parents of Disappeared Persons demonstrated a sit-in in, in Sirinagar, Kashmir. Kashmiris from all over the valley came to take part in the protest. Now, according to the APDP, over 8,000 persons have disappeared so far. Longing for their loved ones and hoping at least to find out what happened to them, the people of Kashmir face unimaginable despair every single day. And one must remember the women of Kashmir who not only lose their husbands and children, but face systematic violence on a daily basis. On tonight's show, we discuss the enforced disappearances of Kashmiris and the struggle of Kashmiri women. Joining us for this discussion is Naim Rathir, who's a researcher at APDP. Joining us from Siri Nagar, also joining Sabia Dar, who's a human rights activist from Siri Nagar. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, Sabia, let me begin with you. Can you please tell us about the sit-in that took place and what were the demands being put forth? Uh, hello. <clears throat> yeah it's a uh, sit in we uh, actually apdp's uh, uh, the movement against enforced disappearance uh, in kashmir uh, association of parents of disappeared persons uh, it was formed by parvina ahengar whose son has been subjected to enforced disappearance by national security guards in uh, 1990 so after that she formed a group uh, which is uh, which is known by uh, apdp uh, she formed the group in 1994 hmm. this sit in we uh, after that uh, this sit in uh, we monthly uh, it's uh, on every 10th of month apdp uh, protests uh, in uh, pratap park near press and clew uh, to remember their loved ones to show the government that we do, we don't uh, we never want to forget we we never forget what happens to us and how we suffers uh, yeah. how we uh, how the uh, uh, people of kashmir how the women suffer due to the disappearances by security forces we demand india to ratify the international convention on enforced appearance they have signed it but they didn't ratify it yeah. we demand india to ratify it and we want india to investigate on the uh, perpetrators who have been uh, involved in the disappearance of their kids and kins Uh, Ms. Sabia, I do want to talk about the International Convention for Protection of All Persons, uh, the ratification of it further. But before that, I want to ask you, how long have you been a member of uh, APDP? Uh, actually, I am working from last uh, eight to ten years with APDP. Uh, I was in. Uh, I was a student of uh, first year when I joined APDP. and you're saying that the demonstration the sit in takes place on the 10th of each and every month so after yes, each yes. and every month do you feel like the population the number of people in the sit in increases does it stay the same does it decrease what's that like no no it's increasing it's increasing day by day because people gets awareness that everyone wants uh, international attention everyone wants that their issue must be solved because enforced disappearance is a, a crime against humanity because people does not know whether they are dead and alive yeah. if we talk about killings people know people have the uh, graves of their uh, people see the dead bodies of their uh, loved ones but here we if we talk about enforced disappearance people are in uh, continuous dilemma they they are in mental agony whether the person are dead or alive yeah. so the, the people the, the people in the protest increases day by day whether it's uh, the persons whose kids have been subjected to enforced disappearance or the people who come for solidarity who shows the solidarity with with the disappeared persons yeah Ms. Sabia, so you mentioned here how the number is increasing, and I want to ask uh, Mr. Naim here that uh, Sabia mentioned there is an increase in awareness of how this is a human rights violation and forced disappearances, and the number that was given was eight thousand enforced enforced uh, disappeared persons. Is this number understated? I th I think you know as if one to, when one talks about Kashmir, one has to first and foremost you know be aware of the fact that Kashmir is in the middle of a war, has been in the war since you know last thirty years. You know India has basically enforced a war on people in Kashmir, and in any kind of a war-like situation, you know the first 
casualty is the truth and in the in in the case of you know apdp or people who have been subjected to disappearances there are various international human rights organization is which put the number between 8000 to 10000 but since you know not everything can be documented in kashmir you know not everything could be documented not you know because of the war like situation always yeah. going on because of also the lack of resources human rights organizations have i think this number is an understated it can be more you know but it can't be less than that so i think 8 to 10000 is some rough kind of estimate that people have yeah. And okay. Mr. Naim, can you tell us while you're doing conducting research for uh, APDP, what are some of the key findings you have found out in, let's say, the past six months? I think one of the you know major research is that we sort of carry out at APDP is the foremost is we document the cases of enforced disappearance, what are the circumstances in which they have happened, and then we also document how the Indian judiciary itself, despite people approaching the judiciary for you know justice, how Indian judiciary has not provided people justice, which in this case means return of their loud one. Yeah. So, but one has to understand, you know, in Kashmir, Indian state is at war with the memory of people. So, a APDP, in a sense, is also a movement that fights the forgetfulness. You know, if you really look, let's like, say, for example, 30 years ago, someone has been subjected to enforced disappearance. And the Indian state tries people, you know, should forget about it. But one of the major contributions and, you know, one of the major aspects of the work of APDP is it has kept the memory of the disappeared alive. And till this date, it is still demanding their whereabouts. The simple message that APDP has sort of is, you know, uh, you know, giving across the board and always demanding the government of India is if you have taken our loved ones yeah. in front of us, just return them to us. Yes. And Mr. Naim, on that same point, I want to ask uh, uh, Ms. Sabia Adar there, uh, quoting something an APDP spokesperson stated during uh, the sit-in, the state has been at war with the memory of the people and it has time and again t tried various tactics to erase this issue from the public memory. Ms. Sabia, how, what are the tactics employed by the Indian state here in order to erase the memory of those who have disappeared? Uh, first of all, if all if we talk about the judiciary, the judiciary is the judiciary. If we talk about the case uh, cases, uh, they have went for sanctions, sanction for prosecution to the center, because under Aswa Section Seven, you for to prosecute any armed personnel, you have to bring sanction for prosecution from uh, Delhi. So it takes a long uh, twenty years to fight the case. It takes a some families have been fighting from 90s to get the justice. But after that, the files are pending with home ministry. They, they didn't, they didn't get, get justice for the prosecution. These kinds of the legal systems, which uh, families include from 20 years, 30 years, the families uh, think that it it is it is all meant, uh, it all meant uh, to, uh, to it, it all meant so that the people sh should forget about what they what they have faced. Delaying the justice. So if uh, we talk about yeah, delaying the justice, if we talk about uh, SHRC, SHRC is uh, because uh, to get an uh, to get an exgressor, to get an SRO, a job which is meant for the killing persons. Here, if we talk about uh, enforced disappearance, the person is not neither dead or nor alive. So. For that SRO 43, people have to wait for seven years. Seven years after that, they can uh, get uh, uh, yeah, FIRs. After that, they can they are uh, yeah, they, after that they can go for SRO 43. They have to wait for seven years hmm. uh, to proceed for an SRO 43. So these kinds of tactics are meant so that the people forget they 
people people don't have faith in justice. So, Ms. Sabia, here you mentioned how the state and the legal system is working towards erasing the memory. Uh, Mr. Naim, what is the legal status of enforced disappearances being an offense in Indian law? There is no law actually in the Indian judiciary that somehow deals with the enforced disappearance, you know. But internationally, since, you know, if we if you are aware that in 2017-18, there was UPR4 under the United Nations where 36 countries all over the, over the world asked India to ratify the treaty of, you know, against enforced disappearance that it has signed. So it has just signed it and it has not ratified it. And but if we look at the domestic, you know, judiciary of the India, the domestic judicial system of India, there actually that doesn't exist a very proper or a very clear-cut law on enforced disappearance, which in larger sort of political sense means that Indian state is a denial that enforced disappearance don't happen in their areas that are under their jurisdiction, you know? Yeah. So there actually isn't any law. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Sabia, we've been talking about the laws here and the legal aspects of uh, enforced disappearances, but I want to take a human angle here. You as a woman, what can you tell us about the experiences of other Kashmiri women who have lost their loved ones and not, don't know where they are? Actually, it's a, uh, it's a physical torture, it's a mental torture, because uh, you are living in an ambiguity. You don't know whether the person is dead or alive. Most of the parents, they have still hope that uh, they will come back. They live in a dilemma, in a continuous dilemma from last 20 years, 30 years. They knew in a dilemma that someday, one day will come, he will come. Most of the families uh, told that we have a nightmares, that uh, if we get a knock on a door, we thought that uh, here they come. So people, it's a most, if we talk about those who have lost their uh, fathers, because half widows are there, half orphans are there, it's new to the rest of the world what half widow is. It, it's, half widow is a word. It's new to other, but we have, we have, we have working half widows from last 10 years so they are facing they don't have uh, their uh, livelihood they have they have, li have livelihood problems they have problems on the uh, social stigma they have problems on uh, because we know that uh, the uh, cultural uh, systems of Kashmir is different. The people, the mothers, they are not well educated to earn their livelihood. The people, the parents, old age parents lost their sole bread earners. So they have problems on that front. People, most of these families suffered from lifelong ailments like uh, diabetes, like BP issues, heart ailments. Though, so though they suffer from all fronts of life, whether it's legal, whether it's medical, psychological, and education of their children gets, get it, gets affected. Yeah. Of course, it must be uh, something that impacts each and every aspect of their lives. Thank you so much, Ms. Dar, for talking to us. Uh, Mr. Naim Ratter, taking the conversation forward, uh, in the UN report which was released on Kashmir, there was an indication and there was a highlighting of the fact that mass rapes are being used as a tool to suppress the Kashmiri people and being used to impact the psyche of the Kashmiri women. What can you tell us from your research about that? I think, you know, if we look at, you know, the world history or if we see how occupations or how states control people, especially if they are occupying an area, you know, sexual violence per se has been always used as a tool you know, to, to, to suppress a particular people, to suppress the political aspirations of the people. And, you know, under the threatened bully in Kashmir, Indian state, you know, since Kashmiris rose up against state with arms in the 90s, early in the 90s. So since then, Indian state has used rape, sexual violence, assault on women, beating of the woman, and many other, you know, uh, adjacent, you know, uh, 
you know, things that, you know, come under the ambit of sexual violence, it has used it as a tool to suppress the political dissent. And yes, and, you know, there are lots of, you know, cases of rapes that have been happening to Kashmiri women. For example, people are much aware about Kukunan and Pushpura yeah. mass rape case. But... You know, despite and the their, women their, there never received justice because of the impunity that the soldiers enjoy. What can you tell us about that? How are the soldiers protected? And can you tell us about the problem specifically with the Armed Forces Special Powers Acts? I think, you know, Armed Forces Special Powers Act, by the very nature of it, it's a law that sort of actually provides impunity to, you know, Indian armed forces to, you know, on the mere suspicion, they can kill anyone, they can detain any person, and they won't be prosecuted for that. They can't ever be put on trial for that. And second thing is, you know, when you are living under a military occupation, and which is very masculine in this yeah. nature, one does yeah. not, you know, one does not actually... Uh, you know, one does not expect that any justice will be done because of the very precise nature of the army, the, the military occupation. Yeah. So, so uh, Mr. Too, Naim, hold so on even, to that know. thought. Hold on to that thought. We're also joined by Mr. Harder, who's a journalist joining us from Siri Nagar. Thank you so much for joining us. Mr. Harris, one of the things we were talking about earlier was the demand for India to ratify the International Convention for Protection of All Persons from Enforced Disappearances. How would this ratification change anything in Kashmir? And what would be the purpose of this ratification that the Kashmiri people are pushing towards? Uh, basically, as, as Naeem uh, um, uh, said before this, uh, most of the armed forces uh, work in, in, in complete impunity. They are immune to, uh, to persecution and all. So uh, the, the human rights activists and, 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 and the call from the public has been that uh, if there is any ratification in, 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 in this laws regarding enforced disappearances, torture, and uh, many other such uh, you know, uh, actions that, that cause severe damage to the public and public property, uh, would, would bring at least some uh, sense of uh, relief in terms of uh, at least uh, we, the forces could be take, made accountable. Yeah. Uh, there is a tr huge stress deficit on the on the uh, uh, the, uh, the the the, uh, the judicial and the law enforcement agencies in in, in the valley. Uh, and Mr. Harris, what is the Indian authorities? What is the Indian government doing to rectify that trust deficit? Is there anything being done? I mean, other than uh, political posturing, uh, uh, to be honest, uh, there is a very stiff resistance both from the armed forces and from the center to 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 change to bring actual any change to bring any actual change on the ground. Uh, so far, we have seen that whenever there is a talk of 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 uh, reining in forces or or uh, ratifying laws or at least uh, make sure that the impunity that is given to the armed forces is, is not there. Uh, you see, uh, you know, the army general or, or somebody from the security forces uh, giving out statement, calling out such polit political parties, uh, you know, uh, that this, is, this won't be possible, that yeah. their mere existence in the valley would become jeopardized. So other than political posturing, I don't think uh, much uh, the, the, the armed forces can actually work in, in, in such a uh, place where the whole population is, is uh, resentful to your very own existence at, at that place. And you mentioned so here it, the it, very it, own existence, uh, the population is resentful. And I want to ask here, what has the Indian state done systematically to prove that the Kashmiri people are not their own, but in fact are the other one they can conduct systematic violence upon? See, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, what, what you often hear, uh, the policy makers or, or the government, both in Delhi and, and in the Srinagar, keep saying that India, uh, Kashmir is an integral part. So at least on, on the optical level and at the, at the political posturing is that we are the same people, we are not something uh, different. Unlike in case of Israel-Palestine, where uh, they are quite distinct, uh, you know, in, in stating that we are not two, we are not one, but we're two different people. So in that sense, it's an inclusive, uh, uh, you know, inclusive politics, uh, but a very 
and forceful inclusion. Uh, so on that level, uh, there may not be a systematic, uh, uh, you know, process to exclude people, but yeah. uh, the, the system is 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 for, for is 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 developed in such a way that uh, you become marginalized in, in, in whether job creation or or seeking uh, legal refuge if if you have been uh, anything is wronged against you, if you have been wronged. So uh, th that sort of discrimination uh, exists, but it's not uh, an open one, or it's not like uh, you're, you're not called out for being Kashmiri. The, uh, but within the valley, the, the perception uh, among the people is that, that the identity is definitely uh, under threat. The existence, yeah, it's, it's, it's under threat as well, because uh, as you know, the, the Modi government has has thrived on identity politics, have has has risen on on religious uh, on divisive and Haris, religious I politics. I wonder, with the elections being held on April 11th, what is the atmosphere like? What are the sentiments of the Kashmiri people? Is there more? Is the fear being heightened? Uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, there is there are no uh, assembly elections going to be held in in the valley. Uh, the, the election commission announced that because of the prevailing security situation, the assembly elections would be delayed. Uh, but uh, as uh, the the parliamentary elections, which which happen across the country, would be done on in, in five phases. Uh, usually, what we have seen in the previous parliamentary elections as well, that the low, the turnout is usually very low because. Parliamentary elections, as as in any other country, are happened on national uh, for national politics. What happened for, and people here don't relate um, as much as they would probably for a state election. But what about uh, the fact would... that what's going to be happening within India for political gains might impact Kashmiris living in India and also in Indian occupied Kashmir? Frankly, uh, I mean, uh, the, the belief is there that uh, it doesn't really matter who is going to come into the power in Delhi, because Delhi, irrespective of who comes to power, whether it's BJP or whether it's Congress, the policy remains the same. It's muscular and it's it's, yeah. it's militaristic in its approach. So it really doesn't matter which 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 government is going to come into power, because the successive governments we have seen uh, right since 47 uh, until recent times, they have a they have a, the policy how to deal with Kashmir and both within uh, in its internal dynamics and external dynamics always remains the is is yeah. constant. So it uh, so that's why people don't have much expectations uh, on whether any change in the center uh, uh, government would bring any relief or would would uh, escalate the conflict within the valley. I take your point there. And Mr. Naim, I want to ask you something related to the sit And One of uh, the other hands of the APDP was that the armed forces stop harassing and humiliating the youth. What can you tell about uh, us about the state of the youth in Kashmir, Indian-occupied Kashmir? Well, I think, you know, state of the youth in Indian-occupied Kashmir, Kashmir, I mean, when it's a military occupation, so it's understandable how people are living there. And that is utter... I mean, people are living very desperate, life was very fearful, life was especially the youth. You know, some days ago, I traveled across some districts in Kashmir, actually, to, you know, trying to assess what actually people go through. There is a lot of fear going on, and that, that fear is bringing up the anger in youth, mostly. And there is a, you know, uh, you know in a feeling of that this place is going nowhere, this place is sort of, they have been, it's a feeling of being caged, you know when there is so much militarization around there is so much fear so much you know harassment around so naturally the people especially the youth who have aspirations for better life they feel extremely caged and they feel their their very dignity and their very existence is under threat so that is one of the feelings of the youth and another feeling of the youth as is very natural and very subsequent from what follows is that the youth of kashmir have often you know they find them 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 them, them themselves sort of heading towards an abyss heading towards Kaldi sacks where there is, you know, no sort of, there, there is no career, there is no life. And because when you, you don't have a dignity, when each and every day the military occupation, the laws, the, the, the suppression tells you that you even are not a human being. So yeah. you can understand from there, if you are denied your basic humanity, if you are denied your, your basic uh, agency, then I think things are pretty much going to get difficult for you as a people and as an individual.
Definitely, and that's an important point you make there about the anger and frustration that's coming up in the youth. Uh, Mr. Harris, when we're talking about, and how you mentioned earlier, that it frankly doesn't matter who is in power in India because the conditions in Kashmir will probably remain the same. What can you tell us about the insurgency gaining the indigenous retaliation against the armed forces gaining momentum, even though knowing that no matter who's in power, things will not change? Uh, it's 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 really really how you perceive uh, whether it's it's the ongoing insurgency right from the 90s or is it a new phase of insurgency? It really uh, depends and how do on you how you it? want. Uh, I would say uh, it is it's 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 uh, it has a new dimension for sure. But I say it's a continuity. Uh, it, it did it it had a brief lull, but I guess. Uh, because of the the geopolitics and because of the changing dynamics within the valley, uh, it it had there was a uh, there was a brief period where you didn't see uh, you know insurgency at, the, at at as much as it was in 90s or as much as it's now. I would still say uh, it hasn't. It is not up to the scale what it was in the 90s, but definitely the nature of it is quite different. We, well, we, what we is see... that new dimension you were alluding towards uh, just a few seconds ago? Uh, basically, in the 90s, uh, many of the politicians joined militants, uh, militant ranks, and most of them were, uh, well, were uh, middle-aged men. The current generation, which, which are taking arms, are quite young. Their age scale is, uh, age uh, bracket is quite young. And they are primarily driven by the, 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 uh, the goal that they have to militarily, uh, you know, re replace the, the Indian forces in the, in the valley, which may not have been the case in, 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 in the 90s, where the, where the people took guns because they saw it as 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 a political process uh, that to to force India and Pakistan to come on the on on the table negotiating table, so uh, the, the 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 nature of the gun at that time was political. It is it it the, largely the goal is still the same I believe, but but the current lot which is joining the militancy are more hardened in their approach and they yeah. don't see necessarily a political process uh, backing their gun. They see and how does that just a, the last question to you, you're saying that the youth has become more hardened. Is it the same point that Naim was making too, that when you're witnessing so much trauma from generation to generation, it's bound to happen? See, uh, when Kashmiris took guns in the 90s, Kashmiris didn't have a history, at least in the recent times, of, of being violent and uh, uh, expressing a political resentment through violence. So over a period of time, Kashmiris have all, all, also evolved as, as, as people and uh, the, the new generation has all, all seen just violence all their lives, have seen the militarization, has seen guns and, and, and gun fights. Yeah. which previous generation was not privy to. So in that sense, obviously, uh, the, 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 there is a sense of hardening of positions, of, 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 uh, of becoming much more ardent, in, 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 much more convicted in, convicted in their, uh, you know, uh, conviction yeah. in their uh, okay. work. Thank, so, thank you for that point, uh, Haris Zergar. Thank you for joining us. Thank you also, Naim Ratar, for joining us. We're going to take a short break. When we return, we're going to have another story for you. Stay with us. Welcome back to In The Special, while we begin another story. With the announcement of the Indian elections on April 11th, it becomes imperative to evaluate the years of Prime Minister Narendra Modi in office. On tonight's show, we review Modi's years, but with sharp focus on, on how things have changed for the women in India. For this discussion, we're also joined by Dr. Lubna Sa Sarvat, who's a General Secretary of Socialist India, joining us from Hyderabad, India. Also, we are joined by TK Raj Lakshmi, who's a senior deputy editor at Frontline in Delhi. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, um, Ms. Uh, Raj Lakshmi, I'd like to begin with, with you. So, of course, when we talk about the Modi years, there has been an evident rise in the Hindu nationalism in Hindutva and social theory and many reports coming out of India show that when there is growing intolerance, the women of society face a double discrimination. Do you agree with that uh, theory and that analysis? And do you think that's what that's what has been happening in India? See, uh, see, I think uh, I think it applies, you know, in all situations where where there where there is uh, you know a rise in uh, 
general intolerance in society, uh, women uh, as well as the poor, they do get affected, uh, in fact, uh, far more comparatively to other sections of the population. And when we're now, contextualizing uh, it specifically to India, how do you think that was being done in these years? No, of course, you know, uh, see, the BJP has made no bones uh, of the fact that it is a Hindu nationalist party and uh, and it uh, and it owes its uh, uh, its ideological in, uh, you know allegiance to the RSS the Rashtriya Swayamsevak Sangh where uh, which uh, in which its broad agenda is that to to create a Hindu Rashtra now within the Hindu Rashtra there are certain values uh, you know called you know Indian civilizational civilizational values where where they locate women also you know how they see women how they view women so, so essentially it's a conservative way of Way of looking at women and uh, uh, you know and of viewing you know women's uh, uh, status as well as in uh, uh, as well as you know empowerment. So so from that perspective and then uh, and then top it uh, and to top uh, it now you have uh, you have you know intolerance right you you have a certain uh, certain intolerance towards certain communities which is also part of their Hindu Rashtra uh, uh, you know scheme of things. So, yeah. uh, so they are from their point of view, uh, they seem to be doing what they are expected to do as a, uh, 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 as a, you know, as a Hindu, uh, let's say, nationalist party, right? But, uh, but then, when, when, when you come to government, when you form government, now there are certain expectations. There are certain expectations of a certain, you know, manifesto because, because they are, after all, uh, you know, a democracy. And yeah. uh, that to a constitutional democracy, right? So, 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 the, so you have a certain sort of minimum. You you have a certain expectation that and, that, and, that whichever government forms, yeah. And uh, Raj Lakshmi, you mentioned here the manifesto, and uh, BJP did bank on that fact that they would make the society much more inclusive for women, and that's something they drilled on in their manifesto. But when we're talking about women of all uh, uh, in the society, something that I want to ask Dr. Lubna here, minority women, how are they facing discrimination differently? A UN report uh, titled Turning Promises into Action stated that the average Dalit woman in the country dies 14.6 years younger than a woman belonging to the upper caste. And because of a multitude of factors. What can you tell us about that? Uh, see, the position of uh, minorities or the other marginalized communities, okay? Uh, while uh, poverty is one of the main reasons, the lack of information through education and through lack of proper sanitation and over topped of it all is the a different attitude out of uh, form of a second citizen, you know? Uh, yeah. This is what troubles the women of our country most. Let me be very clear on that. And how you know that? You know that, know that through the attitude, through the spoke of the numerous, not any lay persons from the BJP, but from the ministers, from the top rung of the BJP and its sister organizations such as RSS and VHP, you have minister of the minister doling out statements against the very dignity of women. I don't even go until the financial empowerment, nor to their uh, wealth, uh, the wealth that the women hold or to any other things. I am going to just speak about the self-esteem. At the end of the day, when BJP today, Narendra Modi, every day, every paper, you have his advertisements like the corporate advertisements today, be just before the elect election date was declared. And I want to tell that it's not these numerics we're talking about. We want to see at the end of the five years, what was the the change, uh, upper positive change in the self-esteem and the security that a woman on the street is feeling? Yeah. Period. How yeah. does it count? Where, where, don't tell me about these numerics, uh, Mr. Modi. Don't tell me about these numerics. How did you increase in the safety and the self-esteem and the informed status, the confidence that you generate in the woman? Did you work on it at all? This is my question. Or you just wanted some numerics to display there? And top of it all, if you exclude the Muslims from all the minorities in the marginalized, what about the triple talaq bill? What did you want to achieve with that bill? You wanted to break the families as much as I was an opposing on public domain on the triple talaq, which is most regressive and not mandated by the Islam. So much is the triple talaq bill. The triple talaq bill is an affront to the constitution of India and a contempt of the Supreme Court.
Yeah, and Dr. Lumna, you raised ver uh, some very important points there and something that I also want to ask uh, Raj Lakshmi her opinion on. What do you think about all that Dr. Lubna has stated out here and the problems? No, clearly, uh, the uh, the triple talaq bill, uh, everybody uh, uh, saw through what, what the government was actually up to. It was not, uh, it was not legislated uh, out of concern for Muslim women, clearly, right? Yeah, it was it was essentially uh, to sort of criminalize it. I mean, when 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 everybody uh, uh, when the demand was, it should be a civil law, and that because all such in, uh, all such you know marriage as well as divorce laws are civil in nature. So why why sort of single out you know and uh, you know and criminalize uh, you know a certain law uh, law now yeah. now the, the fact remains is that there was there was general agreement from all the women's organizations who had been sort of. Uh, who were on the same page that this triple talaq in one sitting should go because because I think in Pakistan too it's uh, it is you know illegal right in 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 several Islamic countries it is illegal therefore uh, it was uh, because there was in fact general agreement but but there was no there was no demand that it should be criminalized right so it was not but, but this government it goes a step Ra further Raj Lakshmi so I also the, want to uh, becomes, we yeah. have discussed that and I've registered your point there but also another thing I want to bring our focus to is something that Narendra Modi uh, claimed during his election campaign which was passing of the women's reservation bill which still, uh, still remains to be a very controversial issue because it has not been done Rahul Gandhi has pointed towards it several times that their government is in support of it even though Narendra Modi's government has uh, has had the majority. What has been the issues for them to pass this? Right. Uh, well, well, well. In general, and you know, if one speaks uh, of the subcontinent as such, the participation of women is extremely low. Now, coming back to India, yes, yes, the promises were made that they would enact the 33 percent in practice for women legislation as they come to office, and it came with a huge, uh, uh, huge majority. So the first thing that everybody expected. Yeah, but then appears and and there's no sign of it. On the uh, on the other hand, you know what has happened, and it's extremely unfortunate. Is that um, is that you know in several uh, for several you know local body elections, panchayat elections, and especially uh, in states uh, won by the BJP, uh, we we have, uh, you know there the governments have uh, have sort of you know placed several conditions you know there are several conditionalities that you have to have a toilet or you have to be sort of educated up to a particular level in order to contest for those for those local body elections and as a result of that several women have got you know excluded from the process so 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 on the one hand uh, we have we have slogans like you know beti padhao and beti bachao yeah. yes it's very progressive on the face of it it is uh, everybody welcomed it, but then ultimately uh, it should also mean something. So there, I think there there have been severe shortcomings as far as uh, as far as the commitment to uh, to uh, to you know saving yeah. the girl child. So the and, child sex uh, ratio has seen. Rajakshmi, uh, hold on to that death. thought. You made a very important point there. The face of it, the manifesto seems to be very progressive, but. Uh, little implementation has come along with it. We're also joined by Rashmi Saxena, who is a journalist and a political and foreign affairs analyst joining us from Delhi. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Rashmi, for joining us. So when we're talking about uh, the manifesto of BJP being progressive, also one thing that they wanted to tackle was in relation to rape laws. Uh, but a report in June 2018 released by Thomas Reuters Foundation stated India is the world's most dangerous country for women due to high risk of sexual violence. So even though there has been uh, amendments in the law, do you think there has been equal implementation of them? Thank you for having me on your show. The point which I want to highlight is that what a government promises to do, what it does, and finally what happens on the ground, there is a vast gap in this. Yeah. So while the intention of the government may be good and may be very holy, but what really happens on the ground is what we need to know. And if you see the ground report vis-a-vis -vis the various schemes that have been launched, I would say, yes, it has made a beginning and it has probably made some marginal difference, more so in attitude than actually uh, really coming down to the grass uh, yeah. root level. I'll just give you one example. 
which is really, um, you know, very topical at the moment. And this is of trolling on the, uh, you know, internet or email and uh, through all these social media. Now, what has happened is that we, a lot of women, and especially working women, own telephones, uh, these own these um, mobile phones, and they are on uh, WhatsApp groups and things like that. And we have had a number of cases, which includes women journalists, of being trolled and intimidated over and, you know, uh, verbally abused. And now, finally, the Ministry of Women and Child Development has opened some avenues to redress their complaints. But the fact is that how many women actually access them and do get to them and what happens? What is the follow-up action? Yeah. What we need to ask is what is the follow-up action to all these schemes and um, initiatives which are being taken. And Rashmi, you mentioned that here that how say, things uh, are working on the grassroots levels. And another thing I'd like to highlight here is a Human Rights Watch report in 2017, which listed out the barriers for rape survivors in India, which included humiliation at police stations. Now, during the 2014 election campaign, Narendra Modi did state that he wanted to make more women-friendly police stations. How far along do you think he came on that promise? Well, the police stations have opened, and they have been, you know, that one step, one center initiative where you have, uh, you know, these, uh, uh, you know, this came out from the nearby fund, uh, and this is for victims of uh, violence. And you have these centers at various locations which provide uh, shelter, a police, as legal and medical uh, counseling, and the 24 helpline. But the fact is that how many women actually get there and what happens? Even if women get there, what is the percentage of redressal? That is what should be found out. Yeah. And having said, come to the point that, yes, India has been talked about vis-a-vis -vis in the context of rape cases going up. What I would like to point out is, yes, that happened. But I think one way I would look at it is that it's a you know way to use the word positive is that men are now coming out more to report what is happening. Yeah. Earlier everything everything was kept you know behind doors and sort of people were reluctant to talk. But there is a slight change in that, a very slight change. Where men okay, now uh, come Rashmi. Out Hold on to that point, and that is a strong point there. I just want to show a video of a former judge of India Supreme Court talking to one of our hosts on Indus News. Uh, let's take a look at it. Massive okay. poverty and unemployment and uh, price rise and farmers distress. 300,000 farmers have committed suicide. Every second child is malnourished in India. These yeah. are the real issues. So, Dr. Lubna, when we talked about this, we're talking about the economic front, and there has been an evident rise in unemployment, and women bear the brunt of it. Now, uh, a report in SNP stated that almost 83% of women are worried about their financial futures. What can you tell us about that? What is the state of unemployment for women right now? Yeah, see, already, you know what? what most of the BJP policies have seriously taken a dent on the unorganized labor force in our country and that started uh, right from when they came and in more so when the up government had the bjp government there okay so uh, right from the policies such as demonetization and the policy that orders that all the cat cattle cannot be brought to the market for uh, sale okay so in this manner they were and also the gst all these took a serious dent serious dent on the unorganized market which is more than more than 80 percent of our labor force in our country so and also uh, notwithstanding the agriculture sector itself okay yeah and now you can see the reflection in the manrega policies see what happened was that when the manrega uh, the budget uh, was cut down for these manrega funds it automatically took a hit or uh, hit on the women force in the agriculture and the allied sectors and it's so very important way, that you mention agriculture here and something i'll ask uh, raj lakshmi is about the farmers who have committed suicide and they have almost risen 42 percent in modi years what happens to the widows there now the uh, uh, compensation or the funds given by the government seem to be only around rupees 600 which is abnormal. what can you tell us about the women widows who are suffering on that front 
yeah the 6000 per annum uh, it works out to 500 rupees a month actually yeah. uh, which is you know pittance okay now uh, now what happens to the women yes uh, uh, you know i uh, i mean i can safely assume that all the women uh, uh, they they get reduced you know to agricultural labor uh, you know they become you know agricultural workers right and uh, uh, and agricultural uh, in fact wages you know have been the have been the lowest in the last 3 years okay these are these are latest figures that have come out now i'm sure that a lot of women are also engaged in agricultural work in your country too i do not know how much how much it compares but 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 the work uh, the work you know participation rate you know of women uh, has also been the lowest uh, uh, in the last uh, in, uh, since since uh, in fact you know, independence apparently it's around 25.8% right so uh, why are uh, so why are women getting pushed out of the workforce yes they do comprise uh, so they are being pushed out of the organized workforce as uh, as dr adam just 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 mentioned and uh, and, and they are uh, and raj lakshmi entry, when we are talking uh, about the pensions being given uh, 33% of the women had not applied for the pensions or had not even heard of it is the government trying not to advertise these or why isn't it reaching out at a more grassroots level no i think you know the allocation itself uh, itself is very less isn't it see if you do not allocate at the top uh, the uh, the guarantee that it will reach uh, the the benefit uh, the uh, the beneficiaries you know is uh, get reduced it, you know, the chances that it will reach them uh, uh, in that quantity first because the quantity itself is very small right so then you have various implementation issues you have uh, you have leakages etc so so allocations have extremely uh, you know have been uh, have been cut the allocation uh, to uh, to as in dr adams also pointed out you know yeah. the nrega uh, you know have been slashed uh, in fact the allocation uh, to to you know the women and child department is actually uh, is is, uh, is actually one percent of the total expenditure budget yeah okay now i don't know how much it's uh, spent in the rest of the subcontinent but Ra but rajakshmi you low, make right? a very so, important yeah. point there and something that i want you to hold on but, uh, before that i want to ask uh, dr lubna more about the minority rights now we've been hearing a lot a lot about the cow vigilantes that have been going around in india and uh, many uh, of the muslims bear the brunt of it i wonder when we're talking about this how are women facing violence differently see the biggest ex example of the failure of the indian intelligence and security agencies is one single thing for 5 years the government of india could not bring back najib najib is a muslim jnu student and he is a pre scholar and till today in the he, their cbi tells before the court that we are not able to trace him i mean how can you even tell that i mean you have to justify your existence to tell that and what about rohit vemula see what i why i'm pointing out these students is ultimately who nafisa was affected his sister was affected and what about rohit vemula from our own hyderabad university who was affected his own mother was affected so what i'm telling is that ultimately it's uh, when when you had all these uh, um, all these lynchings going across india it was the women who were affected when you had the beef industry shut down it was the women who were affected when you had the tanning industry uh, closed down just yes you're right and what is the narrative coming out, uh, out from the other side from the extremists how is this being justified see this is justified only in the name of one thing not in the name of the constitution of india not in the name of any law of the life of this land only in the name of so called faith and sentiment today even the babri masjid which has been in litigation and which needed to be declared it begs to be declared that the act of demolishing itself is illegal if it's open we all have to abide by the supreme court we respect and we want to go by the law of the land and the constitution but that same law of land and constitution begs begs to answer from the court that declare the demolition itself was illegal first but and dr lubna don't you think here when we're talking about the constitution even though in letter it says that it is a, a secular state don't you think that's collapsing in spirit see i believe more in the indians than in the government of india right now okay because if you look at the indians at the ground level where we move about on the streets in the buses and everywhere you know the people are still holding on to each other i have seen that i am a witness to all this so india is not india's india's indianness 
the tolerance the fraternity feeling you know fraternity we have it in a preamble of our constitution you know so that that fraternity you can never break it down you know let any government come and go but the fraternity that india has towards its own self and towards its neighboring countries towards the entire world you know that you cannot break it basically that is there in the indianness and i am very much i also feel the same pretty because of so many people across the world whom because i am also the on the editorial board of a uk based journal there where i interact with professors from pakistan from many other countries across the world so this fraternity feeling that the broad mindedness that the basic indian has that cannot be collapsed at any time and that's the faith of india that's the constitutional ethos and the democracy spirit of india yeah okay thank you so much dr lubna uh, sir joining us tk uh, raj lakshmi for joining us uh, rashmi saxena for joining us thank you for watching in this special we'll see you again tomorrow with more stories goodbye